All right, here we go. Mob James, welcome to Vlad TV. Uh, thank you. Pleasure to have you. Pleasure to have Pleasure you. I've been listening to, to a lot of your other interviews, and uh, I think you're a very important part of the whole death row story, you know, being there from the very beginning. Yeah. So I definitely appreciate you coming in. Oh, no problem. So let's start from the beginning. Um, you grew up in Compton. Yeah. And and you were a member of the Mob Piru. Used to be, yes. Used to be. Yeah. Tell me the history of Mob Piru uh, in Compton, because you guys are generally considered bloods, but uh, kind of a specific set, right? Yeah, well, actually, Piru's, we different from bloods, but I mean, our neighborhood was just a lot of us hanging out, and before the violent part came in, we're just hanging out, fighting, and different stuff like that. Um, I got shot in 1980. And that's when we stepped the game up a little bit in 1980, from fighting to really getting violent with it. Mm -hmm. Was there a split from Pyru and Bloods at some point? No, it was always we was always Pyrus. Compton is different from L.A. Mm -hmm. L.A. is more Bloods. Compton is all Pyrus. So okay. yeah, it's, it's totally different. Like, how old were you when you first started getting involved in that? Oh, man. Uh, 12, 13. Okay. Really, like, really hanging out, like, really in it. I think about 16, 15, 16, really, like, full-fledged. Okay. And were you one of the founders, or was it already no, a set? No, no. It was, the mob was already there. Okay. Which, you know, I don't consider the big homie thing, but I don't do the big homie thing, but we had older guys in the neighborhood that that set that way before. We even thought about doing it. Um, we just pretty much picked up where, I mean, they was just like older guys, they was hanging out. They wasn't, it wasn't no gun play and all of that mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. and. That we we brought that to it, really just start the the shooting and the fighting and the, you know doing the other stuff. I mean, we talk about the '80s. That's when the crack era started yeah. to really develop. Because from what I understand, it was very different before crack showed up. It, it was. Yeah. Once crack showed up, you know, for example, I had Big U uh, on my show, and, and he he was locked up when crack first hit the street. When he yeah. came out, he kind of explained to me how all the guns were different. <laughs> So when it when it actually hit was like 83 and I came back home 84 and we went from being able to just and it, it, it changed it because two things happened major the uh, um, the influx of guns and the different kind of guns and then like the automatics the automatics like that, yeah because we hadn't even seen automatics we weren't even having no automatics then and especially like what the the um, most the, we was we was inflamed by the nine millimeter from the movie that came from New York was um, King of New York mm. when um, Lawrence Fishburne had the nine millimeters and the King of New York we was like oh that <laughs> what the you know what I mean because we come from the Clint Eastwood era the the pistols and the four five and the magnums so when crack came all the different movies came that influenced the culture at the same time oh yeah we went from. 38s to, I used to have this stick where I used to cut a bat in half. And that was my weapon of choice. Mm -hmm. Then from 38s to AKs, Uzis, and all of this other shit. So yeah, the game, it went up when, when crack cocaine came. Um, before crack, I mean, we were like solid. Like the neighborhood, everybody got along. Everybody was together. Pretty much how when Suge came, I brought Suge to the neighborhood. He was like crack cocaine. Everything went bad at the after he came. But I mean, okay. Well, you talked about getting shot. Um, I guess you had gotten shot four times total. Yeah. Was that happening early on? Yeah. Uh, first time, guys come through the neighborhood. Uh, we get on the bike to meet them. They get off their bikes and start shooting. I was hitting the chest. That was with a thirty eight. Uh, the second time was with a shotgun. Oh. 
they come get me at the house. We had the Compton swap meet over there, and the Samoans was jumping on one of the little homies. So we get there, a 12-year-old Samoan come from the side of the car and start shooting with a shotgun. And shot me up, I still, still had that, and that was maybe 81, 82. And then um, we was at a party at the Samoans the third time I was hit in the back with a 4-5. And some cat with the wheelchair was talking crip and all that, and I pushed him over and all oh, hell broke loose. So we made it to the van. They start coming running to the van. We got out, did our thing. They start doing their thing. I got hit. So, and the other one, I was just grazed on the side by my set to hang out, and they came through popping. I mean, as you're getting shot over and over again, was there ever a moment like, okay, I got to get out this area? No. Because, no. No. At no point did you say, I I'm going to leave for my safety. Every time, no, nah, we didn't, we, I didn't look at it like that mm -hmm. then. I mean, I was gangbanging. Um, my whole thing was retaliation every time. Got to go back, regardless if it was me or one of the homeboys. If they shot at us, I went back and shot at them. Or, I mean, retaliation, that's just the way we, we live. Well, at one point you went to prison. Yes. For how long? Two years. Okay, that's it? Yeah. Okay, what was that for? <laughs> Violation of my gang probation. I was on the high gang probation thing. And um, I had two weeks left on this probation they had in Compton. And told them, fuck it, I wasn't coming. I wasn't going. And I went to go see my parole officer. They sent me to court. The judge gave me two years in the penitentiary. You violated uh, your probation. Yeah, so I told him, hold up, wait a minute. Two years in the penitentiary <laughs> for two weeks? He said, you had your chance to talk, and mm. that was it. Okay, and that was the last time you got locked up? That was uh, in the penitentiary. That yeah. was the only time I went to penitentiary. Okay. But you were doing jail time after that? No, yeah. I, went to, I went to jail for uh, attempted murder in 92. Did eight months in there, got uh, accessory after the fact, and no more jail time after that. Okay. Now, you and Suge knew each other since you guys were teenagers. Yeah. I guess you met in high school? Well, no, I've been knowing Suge in the neighborhood for, for he'd been there a long time, but his mama wouldn't let him hang out. He didn't, he didn't hang out like we hung out, right. walking the streets back and forth or whatever. And, uh, Suge had a motorcycle, I had a motorcycle. And I would see Suge riding his bike and we'd ride and go banging around the neighborhood or whatever. He couldn't associate with us, should I say. So after that, I think he went, we went to Linwood together and we went to, um, damn, I forgot the name of that little school over there on, on Bullets. But, we went to school together, and after high school, he disappeared. Right, he went to college. Yeah, to play ball. Yeah, UNLV, I guess. Yeah, that's that's where he went. Then when I got out of prison in 1988, he just came to the house, and when he came, man, I've been kicking it ever since. Okay, so during the time in high school, Suge wasn't gang affiliated at all. No, no. Yeah, no, he didn't know. Well, he knew people there in the neighborhood, but he didn't know, like my brothers, he didn't know nobody that's worked for death row. He didn't know none of them. He knew the people off the, on the block, mm -hmm. but he he didn't deal with uh, no homies as far as saying, hey, I'm a power rule, I'm woo woo. No, never. Yeah. Okay. So Shug comes back to Compton. I mean, I guess uh, he went to... He played football, and I think he played. You know, he played football in college, and then he, I think he got an NFL contract, and that ended up not working out. And then he came back to Compton. When when, when he came, when I got out in '88, he, he came the next day. Yeah. I was out one day, and he came over there, and from there, we hopped in the jeep, 
we was riding around. Next thing I know, I was doing the security Budweiser Superfest with him for his cousin, Big West. And from doing that show that night in L.A., we was doing shows all over the place, everywhere else. So that's how he got in the game and started doing it. And then he met Tom Klein. So from Tom Klein, we uh, he had music, cars, and, and, and all kind, you know, sorts of things. So um, Tom Klein was like one of his investors to help with Death Row. And we went from there. Before the whole Death Row thing, um, there was the Vanilla Ice thing. Yeah, that's when it was Fern Hill Records. Yeah. Were you around? Yeah. Okay. So so this story is very fuzzy. Um, you know, Vanilla Ice said that, you know, Suge came over and basically... Suge didn't own shit to that. Suge went to him and pretty much punked him out of his shit with chocolate, yeah. saying that he wrote the shit the whole nine. Ice Ice Baby. Yeah, didn't have nothing to do with it. So chocolate had nothing to do with that song? No. He took the contract to Vanilla Ice, made him sign it, and they gave him a check for it. Were you there when that happened? Yeah, I was with you. Okay. And the story that Vanilla Ice said was that Suge took him to the balcony. No, nah, I didn't. I wouldn't nail on that. No, nah, nah. I don't remember that. You don't part. remember that. But nah. he did punk Vanilla Ice. Oh, yeah, he punked him and a lot of people. What? How did he punk him in that situation? Well, basically telling him what he going to do with his arm around him and told him pretty much what you going to do. You going to sign this paper and you going to pay me for this. Sure, we was just getting into it. We didn't have, we didn't have no artists, no groups. Chocolate wasn't doing nothing. I mean, just a lot of people sitting around. You okay. know, people from Texas trying to get into the music thing. It didn't have nothing. So pretty much everybody, how we was eating was punking people. Okay. So Vanilla Ice actually signed over yeah. the contract and sure got... A big check. Got a big check. Because Ice Ice Baby went like diamond or something. He got a big check, and Chocolate got a check, which she gave him. And all he did is went and bought a, uh, a Mercedes and then had shit after that. Sugar or Chocolate? Chocolate. Chocolate. He but Suge, but Suge actually got a bag. Yeah, Suge got paid fat. Okay. A couple of times. Okay. So the Vanilla Ice thing happened, and you guys are still are still rolling together. Well, I guess originally it was Future Shock Records, right? No. Well, because DOC was involved. Well, that's that's DOC shit. We, when 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 DOC came, Shook started pulling them. Uh -huh. We had Fernhill Records. Fernhill. That okay. others st didn't go nowhere because Tom Klein wanted Shook to live, do Fernhill Records. Okay. Were there any artists on Fernhill at all, or hey, on now one of them? No. None. When he when Suge went and got DOC, this is what we doing, and he told Doc that. So when he told Doc, I want you to come over here with us, now we sitting at the table saying, we finna go and get Dre, Michelle, we going up to Ruthless Records, we doing Woo to Woo, and that's what we did. Okay. The the Vanilla Ice thing happened. Yeah. You know, and then and then there's the Ruthless thing. Was there anything in between where Suge was basically strong-arming people for contracts and so forth, in between. I mean, it was a lot of dirty shit going on. I mean, we was taking studio music. We was, we was, I mean, we was doing a whole bunch of stuff. Terrorizing the industry, pretty much. Exactly. Okay. And everybody was scared. Yeah. Everybody was scared. So then the Easy e thing happened. So I've heard the story a couple different ways. Um, you know, for example, BG Knockout, who was very close with uh, with Easy E, basically said that he said that Dre called him, you know, to meet with him to to sign over, you know, sign him, get him out the contracts or release him or whatever. But when he get there, Suge was there, so they was in a hotel room. Suge had dudes hiding in the closet under the bed, and when he get up there, when they he get up there, Suge locked the door. All these cats come from under the bed and out the closet in the bathroom with guns. You know what I'm saying? And Dre was in there? Dre wasn't there. Oh, Dre wasn't there at nah. all? Nah. Dre set it up, though. Okay. So you know, because he didn't hate Dre. You know what I'm saying? As pe people try to portray, he didn't. Well, the, they was friends once. Yeah, they were time. really close friends yeah. at one point. No, that was at Death Row. We went to Rufus Records and 
got Drake contract from Jerry Heller. Okay. Jerry Heller and his bodyguards was there. Easy was lucky he wasn't there because we'd have got him too. But Easy kept his shit at home. So when we went into Ruthless Records and pretty much strong on Jerry, mm -hmm. which he don't want to which call him, but sure, you go in there and talk to Jerry, I got these dudes right here which is his bodyguards. So we set out and waited for Suge to do what he had to do. Suge came out, Suge had a check, and he had paperwork with Dre and Michelet. He had a check? Yeah. Okay, so Jerry Heller wrote him a check? Gave Suge money, yeah. Okay. But then at one point, Easy e signed over uh, a contract. Easy e did a song saying that he, that's why he's still getting paid, so I don't think he ever got Eazy-E. Okay, well, I mean, because the story was was that Eazy-E signed it over, but then a day after he said it was, you know, he signed nah, under duress. And, you know what? We ran into Eazy so many times on Melrose, on Sunset. We had one problem with Eazy, and he got robbed. So I don't know what him and Suge did. It was, I wasn't there, but we never got nothing from Eazy. Okay. So Easy got robbed though? Yeah. You guys robbed him? Yeah. Okay. Well, my own boy Kenny Tubbs robbed him. Okay. So now after having Easy E sign over the 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 ruthless artists, you guys now had the green light to go forward with Death Row Records. Yeah. And originally I think it was with uh Solar Records was partnered yeah. uh with Death Row. Yeah. Uh Dick Griffey and, and so forth. And I interviewed um you know, who later became the president of Solar Records, and he told me about mm -hmm. kind of the details of it. Um, there was a situation in the studio where uh, someone was using the phone. Do you know about this? Where, where Suge made, the, made those guys strip? That night, Suge comes into the building, you know, goes up to the, to, the, to the third floor, and one of the Stanley brothers was on the phone. They asked the guy to get off the phone, and he said, and I think the Stanley brothers had been part of the world-class wrecking crew. And uh, they were actually there to try and get Dre, who by then is, is becoming known as a, as a hit producer, to do something for them. And so he tells Suge, he didn't know who Suge really was. He said, hey, look, I'm a, uh, I'm one of uh, Dre's guests. Go talk to him. And Suge said, I don't talk to him. I run this. He said, man, go leave me alone. So Suge apparently goes out goes back downstairs to his car, gets a gun, comes back, puts the gun to his head, and says, motherfucker, I told you to get off the phone. So then he hangs up the phone, Chuck brings him into the studio, and has everybody, you know, people from the rehearsal, I said, I want you all to come in here. And he said, this is what's gonna happen if you use that phone. Tells uh, uh, the guy to take off his clothes, and he says, I'm not taking off my clothes. So then he shoots the gun he has by the guy's ear. Then he has a guy undress, uh, and he says, could fuck you up, but I'm not gonna do that. But I know where you live, I got your driver's license, I know where your mama lives, and this is just a lesson for all of you all. If you use that phone, I'm gonna fuck you up. No. Okay, you don't know about that. Don't what, know about that. what year was that? Uh, I'm no. not sure. There were solar studios and you know, we, I, we 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 did we did so much. I mean, we did a lot of things, and a lot of people was was punked. Uh, a lot of people got slapped. A lot of people, um, death row was death row, and a lot of people got bullied into a lot of shit. Okay, so. You guys are working, you know, Death Row is working on uh, The Chronic. And Suge is associating with you and the other Pyrus mm -hmm. at this point. Was Suge ever, like, made a Pyru himself, or was he just the the money guy? Suge was, Suge was the money guy. Suge was never, like I said, when we... He, we did Budweiser Superfest. He asked me how many bloods I can get, mm -hmm. how many you want. And from there, with his money and 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 everybody clinged to Suge. 
because now now you got money. Now, okay, I'm going to buy you this. I'm going to take care of this. That's how Suge, Suge bought his way in. Now I got my brother and all these guys coming from the penitentiary and the guys that my brother brought, it was, you couldn't look at Suge wrong. So now they accept Suge as one of us. He lived in the neighborhood. He'd been living in the neighborhood, so he's one of us. Right. But fathers, you know, putting in, putting in, you know, breaking bread in the neighborhood, he never did that. So his money right. got him in that. Well, I mean, he wore red suits. He had a mob ring. Uh, all you that know. came all that came way after. Okay. All that came after my brother came. Before that, when we first started, Suge, if you look at all his videos, Suge had a either a gray suit or a black or something like that. When the muscle got there, like you couldn't look at him. When the muscle came, that's when the, the, the suit changed, excuse me. The, the suit change, the cigars, uh, the rings. Mm -hmm. That's when all that came. So when he felt untouchable, that's when that's when Suge Knight changed. That's when the big Suge came. Mm -hmm. Well, I interviewed Reggie Wright. Mm -hmm. And he said the way that he linked up with Suge was... We had got intel that... Um, a few of the guys that was working for Death Row Records was planning on robbing and kidnapping Shug or holding them for ransom. One of his employees? Yes, homeboys. Okay, quasi employees. Yeah. Were planning on kidnapping him and, and, and ransoming him. him. Yes. Trying to get a ransom for him. Correct. Okay. My father got that intel. Yeah. Do you know about that situation? Yeah. What? At that point, um, it was it was a lot of guys in the neighborhood that wasn't getting nothing, and it was some that was getting three, four hundred dollars every two weeks. Down everybody knowing what's happening, so here you have um, P. Miller give all his partners a million dollars and tell them to do what they gonna do. Well, we know Suge got it. Why Suge ain't did that? So a lot of the guys was like, let's just kidnap his ass and get our money and, and say, fuck this dude. But then you had some that said, no, we, oh, he good, he good. That's the homie, woo, woo, woo. So it, it didn't happen. But you had a lot of those guys talking to Reggie Wright because they senior, because they got a lot of respect for him. And they just put him up on it and they told him. Right. And ultimately it never happened. No, no. Well, I mean, it was he was getting it. I mean, he was being extorted too. I mean, I mean, that's how I was getting my money from him. Okay, because I guess you said that whenever you you'd get mad at him, I get a check. You'd get a check. Mm -hmm. How much would you get like during these various incidents? Well, fifteen hundred thousand dollars. You know, depends on how many times. One time I got mad at him. He said he said some stupid shit. And we had a we had the, the hydraulic shop. Let me ride hydraulics. And I think uh, my brother Buncher came in there to get some parts or something. And he said, "This is for the homies." And I got mad at him. And we started arguing. Come to the office. I got something for you. Um, I took Dr. Dre '64 Chevy. <laughs> Come to the office. I got something for you. I ain't giving you back the car. So I got a check, and then he wanted the car. I ain't giving you the car until I get another check. I'm, and I worked him that way. I made more money being mad at him than I did working for him. You know, Reggie Wright Jr. was essentially the head of death row, you know, police security. Were you kind of the head of death row street security? At the beginning, yes, uh, until... My brother, to Buncher came, mm -hmm. and when I when I put told Buncher you gonna go out of town with Suge and you flying with Suge and this and that, that's when I pretty much was said I'm in the backgrounds now, mm -hmm. and um, Buncher was was his right hand man at that time. But you hear a lot of stories 
of like the violence that happened at death row. Mm -hmm. You know, the the most kind of famous one is that Shug would make uh, guys drink piss. No. You never saw that? I ain't seen that. But it it was a lot of times I wasn't there. Uh, The majority of the things that I didn't see, my brother told me about it. And father's drinking pee. No, a lot of them done got their ass whooped now. These guys ain't ain't doing no shit like that, making them drink their piss or or holy shit. I mean, I done heard a lot of stories too, but they weren't like that, man. I guess there was a room with like the door handle was on the outside that, you know, someone, you know, upset Shug, they'd get taken into the room and get the shit beat out of them. And whatever happened at that office happened at that office right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could walk in the door and get your ass whooped at death row. You could be sitting down and and waiting on waiting to see Shug, and somebody come in, hide the motherfucker, and, and they get their ass whooped. I mean, a lot of those guys that that worked there was scared just to come to work because somebody might just come in here and whoop your ass. I mean, did you personally see a problem with that environment? You know, with you know, I mean, you guys were, were the ones that were the enforcers, essentially, but then you had Dr. Dre, who, from what I understand, didn't like any of that shit. Then you had the various other artists and, and so forth. Dre, Dre was scared, too. I mean, it was all those guys, you know, I, I, I look at their videos and all that shit. They was all scared. You know, can't none of them say they wasn't scared. My whole thing about it is you can't treat your artists like that. Why is you getting down like that? Why is you putting the fear in these guys like that. They work for you. They ain't going to do what they do if they coming in here knowing they going to get jumped on or might get jumped on. Um, no, a lot of lot of the shit I didn't like uh, was one of the main reasons why I backed away from Shug now. Yeah. Um, I guess the other guys, they, they just kept that penitentiary mentality and was enjoying it. You know, Trey D's a regular on my show. And, uh, you know, he was kind of describing the environment to me. And, uh, you know, Snoop had his crew of Long Beach Crips. You know, he said there was one particular incident uh, incident where uh, Warren G got his chain taken. Some dude snatched more chain in the parking lot of k and in like about 90, 95, 96, something like that, and had ran in um ran back up in the in the K and Am and so Warren G went and got C style and they went and, you know, they hollered at Suge and Suge brought him in the room with the, you know, the big red death row rug with the they don't step on the logo with right. the Dome Pincher but Damu right there and all this. And it was just a lot of theatrics. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, dude, you getting tickets. What what's really going on? You know what I'm saying? Well because that that's Dre's stepbrother, mm. right? Oh, he got his he got his chain back. We wasn't leaving when unless he was getting the chain back. Uh, some was something else was gonna happen. We we wasn't like that. wasn't no wasn't nobody getting punked that death row when I was there. You know about that situation though? Mm mm. No. When 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 Suge changed, I was gone. Okay, so you started moving. Uh, away. My whole thing was to bag up, and. Me and Suge started falling out. I mean, like really, he was like really pissing me off. And I seen the homies change um, from getting these checks. I, you know, working with him, um, the whole environment was totally different. Okay. You were there for uh, Snoop's murder trial. I, I was his bodyguard for that. You were Snoop's bodyguard. Yeah. Okay. You weren't the bodyguard that was involved in the actual trial. No, I was. Yeah. Suge had me out there for one reason. The Long Beach Crips was coming up there. I guess they was saying that they going to get Snoop because he ain't doing this for their people or whatever. Mm-hmm. So Suge had me grab some guys and post up at the courthouse. If they come up there, we knew what the business was going to be. Y'all ain't finna touch this guy. And it wasn't gonna happen on my watch because I'm getting paid to yeah. to have Snoop back at that time. Yeah, and Snoop ended up beating beating the trial. Yeah. So Death Row is doing just better and better. You know, uh the chronic ends up 
becoming huge. Doggy style comes out. It's huge. Above the rim comes out. It's huge. It's, yeah. Just, you know, Murder Was the Case soundtrack comes out. It's huge. Everything is platinum, multi-platinum, everything else like that. And then Tupac gets signed to the label. <laughs> were you were you close? Were you in the mix when Tupac came around? Or were when, you already kind of moving when, away? When Tupac came, Tupac went straight to the studio. Um, I was I was at the studio a couple of times. Shug uh, brought Tupac to the neighborhood a few times. Didn't like the environment. Uh, he was cool. He was cool at the beginning. Um, just certain things, certain just just different different stuff. I I didn't like the way he started getting down, and backed away from him too. Right. You know, because this is this is something that we've discussed a lot. You know, for example, uh, Shock G from Digital Underground, yeah. you know, who first signed Tupac, said that Suge held down Tupac the way he's always wanted someone to hold him down. You know, here was someone... What, on the thug life aspect? Yeah, exactly. You know, I didn't... I didn't the homies had Tupac more than I think Suge did. Um, Tupac was more of a money thing, I'd, I'd say for Suge. And... and like a trophy, because when he brought Tupac to the hood, people was on Tupac. Um, a lot of the homies clung, clung to Tupac and wouldn't really own Suge like that. You know, it was Tupac. Tupac was hanging and doing what they was doing. You know what I'm saying? But I think Tupac went a little overboard and really thought he was one of the homies. Well, he got the tattoo. He got the, the MOB tattoo. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some people say that it was money over bitches. It was, it was an MOB tattoo, which he shouldn't have never had. Uh, he ain't never claimed the hood. He ain't never been in the hood. He ain't never fought for the hood. Uh, that's some, uh, I want to be from the hood, putting, putting the hood on his records. And, and you're in the studio and you get a tattoo. You didn't come to the hood and ask to have that tattoo. The homies gave you that. You know what I'm saying? Just because of the situation that he was in. He was he was hanging, he was making money, they was chilling. So he, they 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 accepted him. But you can't you can't just bring him to the hood like that and say he he from the mob. Me personally, he wasn't from the mob. Mm -hmm. So you know, Tupac was in jail after the whole quad studio shooting situation. He gets out and he is beefing with uh, Bad Boy Records, basically his first day out. Yeah. I had actually heard that he wrote Hit Him Up like in, in prison. <laughs> he, 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 man, the dude was, the dude was good. He, he was writing songs like it was crazy. Yeah. Um, he when he when he came home he had an attitude, and getting on death row was his way of like his own now, you know what I'm saying. So he already had an agenda, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and Shug just let him roll with it. So he gets out, and there's essentially funk between Bad Boy and Death Row, yeah, because you know Death Row is you know they're, you know I mean. One of their two biggest artists is is beefing with Bad Boy, so now Suge is beefing with Puffy. It was a power move for Suge. Suge was already beefing before Tupac. It this wasn't just Tupac and Biggie. Suge was trying to get at Puffy and trying to bully him like he was bullying everybody else. Right, because some of Puffy's associated artists were now, you know, coming to death row like Joe C. Yeah, like Mary J. Blige, all of them was was was. I mean, Mary J. Blige, she was supposed to went to the people who wasn't paying her right and helped her out of her situation. 
him and Puffy was was edited before Tupac even touched ground in L.A. And I think Puffy just wasn't biting into the shit. We lost the homeboy Big Jake out there. Uh, got killed in the shooting. You know what I'm saying? Sure came home. How in the fuck is that? You know what I'm saying? He's out there riding with you, taking care of business. This didn't, I mean, Shook was in some shady shit, doing too much, and trying to flex. And he couldn't, he didn't have his bodyguards like he normally had. So he was out there thinking people is like really scared of him now. He couldn't take advantage of that this time. Puffy and them went biting into that shit this time. Right. They had their own. Yeah. They, they, he had they killers had too. Yeah, he had right. people with yeah, the business guys too. like Wolf and, and everything else. That was ready to go. Yeah. That was ready to go. So he couldn't, he didn't benefit off of that. Because if he could have got Puffy, he, he got it sold up. So he couldn't do that. So at one point, there was rumors that, that Puffy had aligned himself with the Southside Crips. He did. And there was bounties on death row chains. Yeah. 10000 I think? $10,000. Right. Your mom had a death row chain. She had a little bitty one. Right. Yeah. Well, they were snatching those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were snatching those. Right. That's when it really got serious. They, 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 they used to come on California Street. My daughter's mother is from Southside, and she used to call me and tell me, uh, all them guys from Hot Woo Woofers out from New York and all these guys out here and they buying liquor and weed. We out here getting loaded and they talking about y'all. So Keefe D, who I found out who he was through Paula, which was my daughter's mother best friend, they was all kicking it over there, saying what they gonna do, how they getting down. So I knew they little half-ass moves because of that through them. Mm. So when when Puffy and them came, we knew Puffy and them was here, you know. And then Keefy D was one of the they call him one of the big homies in in in, in the South Side. So it became a situation, and and the is is. is I, w I want to say crazy, but Suge knew what he was doing. Puffy knew what he was doing. And now you got two gangs fighting each other, and they sitting back letting it happen. And they getting paid at the same time, at the same time. So here you got Orlando, here you got Trayvon, and they run into each other at the, at the, at the mall. So... They fight, Trayvon keeps his chain, get his chain. Now there's a beef, the mob is going over here for retaliation, because this ain't happening. And they beefed up their squad, saying, okay, they ain't coming through here, this and that. So it's shootings here, here and there. Now we at the MGM. Right, for the, for the Mike Tyson fight. Exactly. Were you in Vegas? Yeah, you yeah, were. Yeah, I in Vegas. ran six six two. I I was running the club at the time. Right, Reggie Wright was there, but I was doing the door and all of that. Right, and your brother Buntry was there as well. Buntry was at the fight. Yeah, he went to the fight with him. Um, we already knew it was it was finna happen that that they was coming to Vegas, the whole nine, and then um, when they came, they pulled up in front of six six two. I, I alerted a bunch of them and told them that Keefe D and them out here, the South Sides is out here. And they drove off. Now, if you look at the video at the MGM, you know, everybody's saying, and, and this is the killer part, Tupac don't know no South Side Crips. He don't right. know none of these guys. How did he know to go after this dude? And this is one of my problems with Shook. Man, this dude is an artist. This man is worth millions of dollars to you. And you let him go over here and fight a, a gangbanger. A man he knew jack shit about. And this is how he get killed because you you running into a hitter. Orlando Anderson was in the lobby yeah. of the MGM. Trayvon Lane sees him 
and tells everybody in the crew, hey, that's the guy that jumped me. You know, from what I understand, he didn't go to Tupac and whisper in his ear. He told all the big homies that, that there is there's someone in the area that's potentially a danger. If, if and, and, and this is where I say BS, if he went to the homies, the homies would have went after that cat and, and, and dealt with him. Not after Tupac go get him, but the homies would have dealt with that. And Suge should have allowed the homies and let the homies deal with that situation. Not Tupac. This ain't your business. But Tupac goes over there and take off. He, he threw the first blow. Yep. Then after that, everybody else is on him. Okay, and Buntree was part of that crew? Yeah, every, yeah he, everybody Buntry, was I think there. Neckbone, a bunch of dudes. I mean, I ain't gonna give you a roll call, but I mean, it's it's, well, it's all on camera. I mean, it's what it's, I'm yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's all, all on, on camera. camera. I'm not. So if you so, know the faces, yeah. you see everybody that's there. Everybody that was there got a got a lick in, which including Shook. I mean, this guy got up. Yeah, this guy got up. Wasn't busted up. I mean, I know he was hurting because I mean they was kicking the shit out of him, and. Now, that's like kicking a dog. This little dude is with the business in his neighborhood. Right. I mean, I mean, Orlando was being investigated for multiple murders at the time. And, uh, you know, he was known to be a real gangster from Southside. He was a little young hitter. Yeah. He was, he was with it. And I think those guys should have did their homework before they let Tupac go over there and mess with him. Well, I, I interviewed Reggie. And, you know, he said... I didn't see him until about two or three hours after that incident happened. Uh, he was concerned about Pop. Um, this I of concern to say that he was upset with me or anything like that. No conversations didn't come until later. Suge knew it was consequences from the beginning. Yeah. Suge knew it was consequences when they put the $10,000 on the chain. You know, a lot of people sitting here, and and if it wouldn't if it wouldn't for Suge, none of this would ever ever happen. None of this, none of this would be. Uh, Southside would be in their neighborhood, and Mob would be in their neighborhood. All this other bullshit is is is, is stems from Suge. So Tupac could still be here. And and maybe the majority of, of, of the guys that's on death row will still be here. But all of this is Suge Knight. Okay. So the fight happens. Pac goes back to his room and change and everything else like that. And they start making their way towards Club 662. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, Keefe, Orlando, and the other guys in the car are looking for, for Suge and Tupac. Some girls saw Tupac and started yelling, which kind of alerted the, the Southside guys. And they pull up to the car and, and shoot the car up. For number one, they knew that the Southsides was there. They knew what kind of car they was driving. Because you told them. Yeah. They, you got 15, 20 cars following each other. Y'all don't see this car coming past y'all? How did they get away? You know, uh, Buntry chased them. Woo -woo. I mean, they shouldn't have got away. Because right, Buntry was in the the caravan. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's fight night. Vegas is packed. Anybody go to Vegas? Mike Tyson fight. Las Vegas Boulevard is packed. Gang of people. How did they get away? Um, Orlando was mad at Shug that this situation happened because he told Shook, fuck you and your money. This I know. What do you mean by that? What did this do? When, when did Orlando tell Shook, fuck you and your money? At the MGM. Oh, okay. So whatever he had working with him, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But why would he tell him that? So yeah, he, Orlando told him that after he got jumped? When he got jumped, he was hollering, fuck you and your money. Mm. And why these people around him and they they all walking out the door, they they mobbing real fast. And if you look at that video, you see Tupac in front of everybody right. walking like he. Come on, man, you you, you just signed your death. Uh. 
Well, you yourself said that Orlando was the one that killed Tupac. Yeah, Orlando killed Tupac. Yeah. And I had been hearing this for the last 15 years from, you know, friends of mine from Compton and everything yeah. else like that. It was like the worst kept secret <laughs> in, in Compton. Well, a lot of people didn't want to talk about it because, you know, especially his uncle. If he just said it while, while Orlando was alive, that's snitching. That's yeah. You just send your nephew to prison and yourself. Um, yeah, because he was in the car. Yeah, so they, I mean, they ain't saying nothing. But now that he's gone and a lot of key players are gone, you know, everybody can talk about it now and everybody is talking about it. But, you know, you hear that. The police wanted Tupac because he was just Mustafa. This. Yeah. No. Or Suge got Tupac killed because yeah. he was going to leave. Well, I mean, some of them stories you hear, but just don't didn't let it go out the other ear. Right. If you understand what I'm right. saying. Because that, that car was riddled with bullets from front to back. This was not... The concept of Suge paying someone to kill Tupac while he's in the car. That's why. And graze him in the head. like like It was the stupidest... Conspiracy theory. That's why people were saying that, why did Orlando say what he said? And Orlando pretty much told him, if if this going down, nigga, fuck you and your money, I'm going to get you too. And you just got stumped out by a gang of bloods. And, and, and here he is. It's like, man, we finna get these fools. Right. And they didn't have a choice. Right. Standard protocol for people in that life. And, and all the homies should have known. Man, that little cat ain't finna let that slide. That's not finna just go by. And they were shocked that it happened just like that. They didn't even make it to the to the club. So the shooting happened. Um, you know, I actually interviewed um, Chris Carroll, who was the, the first responder, Vegas mm -hmm. police, that showed up. Um, you know, he essentially told me the Tupac's last words were, were fuck the police. Mm -hmm. I looked at him once again, I said, what happened? Who did this? Who shot you? And now he's looking at me, so we're looking at each other in the eyes. And this is kind of the first time he's even acknowledging my presence. And uh, he looked at me, and I could tell he was, you know, he was getting a breath together to tell me. And he looked me right in the eyes, and we looked at each other, and he said, fuck you. And he said it just like that, with an emphasis on that F. I don't know. <laughs> um. Suge and Tupac get taken to the hospital, mm -hmm. but you're still back at 662. Yeah. You get word of what just happened. Yeah. But people weren't thinking that Tupac was going to die because Tupac has been shot other times and he survived. When Suge when came to the, to, to, the, to the club, we asked what was going on. Everybody was finna leave. They was finna shut 662 down. Suge said, no, he going to be all right. He was hit in his medallion. So everybody kept partying. We all stayed there and we partied all night. And uh, I think the next morning or some day after, they said Tupac was dead. So it was like, wow, y'all said he finna live, but then now, he, now he's gone. I mean, and this is something I've, I've talked to, you know, to the outlaws and everything else like that. If you connect the fight at the MGM to the shooting that happened right afterwards. You could say that Tupac died gangbanging because that situation with Orlando was a, as a gang situation. And Pac wasn't a blood, wasn't, you know what I mean? He, he, was, he was rolling with Suge and he I was associated with saying, it. But you see what I'm saying? You got, that's like us. We're not Crips or Bloods, but we could, you know, we could call 50 niggas up here and half of them be Crips, half of them be Bloods. You know what I'm saying? And these is all my homies that I'm a ride with. You know what I'm saying? It's the, it's the same situation. You know what I mean? Pac was ride with them. You know what I mean? Just like they was ride with him. You know what I mean? If some 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 shit kicked off, niggas would have been, been the first to ride for Pac. And he was the same way. He was riding with his homies, whoever it was. It, it could have He could have been with, you know, whoever that day. You know what I'm saying? And, and to break it down uh, even more simpler, me and you become good homies and you get into a situation and I defend you as a homie. Yeah. Take the gangbanger shit away. Yeah. Because me, you not a gangbanger, I'm not a gangbanger. You know what I'm saying? But you own 
Vlad TV. You and know they what I'm saying? Hills. And, and niggas is on your you. hills, and I ride for you. Yeah. Did I die for Vlad TV? You know what I mean? Did I die a reporter? <laughs> Did I die? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, a journalist. I you get very different answers depending on who you ask. But mm -hmm. from your point of view, as someone who's been banging his whole life, or the, you know, a large portion of his life, would you say that Tupac died gang banging? No, I think Tupac died because he put himself in a situation that he he had no business. Tupac didn't have no business doing what he was doing. Right. Which was a gang situation. Which was a gang situation. He shouldn't have put himself in that situation. But, but do you see what I'm saying, though? You yeah. put yourself in a gang situation, so I mean, aren't you gang banging it's, at that point? It's, it's, I mean, you, I mean you, you got hangarounds. You, I'm mm -hmm. guilty by association. And that's what he was. He was guilty by association. Now... I'm not going to play the part just to fit in. You got money. And just like I said before, you you can't go buy another Tupac. You know what I'm saying? You can't go buy another one of them. You got 15 bloods right here that this this what we getting our little change for. So this is Crippin' Compton. We all pot rules from Compton. Go get his ass for what he did. Tupac, you sit, you sit right here in this chair. You my money. Don't let him run off and go hit somebody he don't know nothing about. And that's why the man is not here. He he put himself in a situation that he had no business. It wasn't his business. I don't care. Any one of those guys could have told Tupac he was a paru, a paru. It didn't make him. Yeah, and I think there was the, the Showtime documentary uh, about Suge. And uh, I think Suge talked about, uh, you know, after that situation happened, and he said, well, you know, you hot in the music, but now after this situation, now you're going to be hot on the street side. <laughs> and right after that happened. And, 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 and that's coming from a man that ain't, wouldn't, wouldn't hot from the beginning his damn self. He ain't from no, no, he ain't never had no gun and, and did no drive-bys. He ain't stood at no stoves and fought no crips. Yeah. He he wasn't going to the high schools while we was doing us. He was getting an education. While we was fighting, we went to school just for lunch <laughs> to fight. We didn't go to sit in no class. You know what I'm saying? My I, my little sister, I go to school and she opened the doors for me because I'm pointing out what crip I wanted. And she opened the door, he in her class. So, I mean, we was doing shit like that. She was getting an education. So Suge don't know about, okay, my brother, my, my homie. And Suge didn't give a fuck about us, man. Suge didn't know what gang banging was truly about. You know what I'm saying? Suge didn't go to none of the funerals of the little homies. Mm. He probably can't even name five that died. Mm. So putting Tupac in a situation, he didn't give a fuck. He didn't give a fuck. We lost 15... 11 homeboys in this death row shit. And, and ain't nobody family got taken care of, not even my brother. You know what I'm saying? Right, and, we're, and I want to talk about that as well. Yeah. So, Tupac is shot, and then he dies. And everybody knows that Orlando yeah. and the Southside Crips are behind yeah. him. A war then breaks out in Compton. Yeah. What happened was that all the players that were from Compton came back to Compton. And uh, we were told that, hey, you know, Southside were, was responsible for, for the shooting of Tupac, so it's coming back to Compton. And what that meant to us, a war was about to start. And sure enough, like two days later, uh, it started. Okay. Now, how many people were killed during this war? I think in the next 10 days, we had three people murdered and oh, I, I want to say 11, 11, 11 shootings. 11 shootings, yeah between Southside Crips and the Mob Piru and Looters Park. Okay, so just a full-blown full, full blown war. Full-blown war. How many people got shot in the process of that aftermath on both uh, sides? Honestly, I can't say how many people got shot. I know uh, it was a lot of shootings in the neighborhood, our neighborhood. Yeah. But our neighborhood was mainly, uh, was doing a lot of shooting too. You know, a lot of people ask me, well, if y'all know Orlando did it, why y'all didn't get Orlando? 
number one, Orlando didn't sit in one spot. Right. Orlando knew say, that you guys know that he it, did it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So he didn't sit in one spot and sit on the corner and smoke weed and say, I'm waiting on these mom niggas to come to <laughs> kill me. Right. No, he wasn't in his hood. He didn't hang out like that. Uh, he met his demise doing what he do best. And yeah, he died a couple of years later. Yeah, he, in, a, he, in a drug deal gone yeah, bad. Yeah, I mean, that was his get down. Orlando's grandmother had passed away the night before. And apparently he had been drinking all night with uh, one of his best friends, uh, Michael DeRoe. And they went over to a place called Mom's Burgers across the street from the car wash, get something to eat. Well, he sees a guy that owes, uh, from another gang in Compton, a crip set in Compton, that owes his uncle and his friend DeAndre, um, I forget if it was five grand, 10 grand, hey, somewhere in there about yeah. five grand, over some uh, cocaine. Yeah. So he decides, because they've been drinking and everything else, they got a gun in the car, they're gonna go over and jam him up about the money he owes. Well, this guy's from another gang in Compton called Corner Pocket, and some of the other Corner Pocket gang members were there, and they started coming up, like, hey, what's this all about? Why are you jamming them up? And next thing you know, Orlando pulls out a gun and shoots two of the uh, corner pocket persons that are there, or shoots one of them right away. And then um, another corner pocket guy starts shooting back at Orlando um, and pretty much hits him dead center. I mean, um, he wasn't alive much longer after that. Uh, his partner that was in the car with Orlando um, took the gun and then started shooting back and ended up shooting another um, corner pot guy that shot Orlando. They went around the corner, crashed the car, and we were pulling up there when Orlando was uh, being pulled out of the car. The other guy took off running, dumping the gun. And we're waiting for paramedics, and uh, one of our, our partners, Ray Richardson, was over there talking to Orlando, um, and he was basically taking his last breaths at that time. And. Um, two of the persons at the gas station that they were shooting at also died that day. So it was a triple murder, and it was all dope-related. Had nothing to do with the Tupac. Nothing to know. do with Tupac. If, if we had our way, we'd have got him. He'd have got got by the neighborhood. Well, because even though technically Tupac wasn't a Piru, it happened under your watch. Me, personally, it didn't, it didn't matter if he was a Piru at, at that point. You know, the man got killed and the homies was there and and Suge was the homie and he was with Death Row. Now, I mean, the mob was was Death Row. From the mob to Death Row. So yeah, we didn't have a choice but to try to get, you know, do what we had to do because of that happened. If we didn't, then, you know, we look bad. Right. So didn't nobody have a choice but to do what they had to do. Right, but you ultimately, you guys never got uh, Orlando. No. Yeah. And then he was killed a couple years later, so mm -hmm. at that point. Years later, Keefe D uh, gets caught up in a, in a sting operation and confesses the whole, the <laughs> whole uh, shooting situation to Greg Kading, who you, mm -hmm. you ended up doing yeah. an interview with as well. When you heard that Keefe D, Keefe D confession, what did you think? I didn't believe it because, okay, why is this guy saying this now? Don't he know he can go to jail? Well, everyone in the car, at the time that he did that confession, everyone in the car except for him was dead. Orlando was dead, and there was two other guys in the car, and they were both dead as well at that point. Oh, they, I didn't know they got killed. One of them, one of them died, I think, of natural causes. He was just overweight and... Never, you know, oh, and, and know. poor I health. I ask Pam on that one. No, I no, I, 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 I talked I talk to, to Greg Kading about this. By the time the Keefe D uh, gave you that information, Orlando was gone. What about the other two members of the car? Dre was already gone. Uh, he was in the uh, passenger seat behind okay. the driver. How did, how did he die? He died from natural causes, obesity and uh, health-related causes. Okay. And uh, Terrence Anderson, the driver, he just recently died. Uh, he was shot and killed inside of a marijuana dispensary in Compton, and uh, so now. When was this? Just just recently, within the last couple months. Oh. So, Keefe D's last man standing. 
Now he's free to speak on it. They give him immunity. Yeah, I, I had Greg Kading explain this to me. He's the only living person in that crime. He gets caught up with a bunch of uh, PCP, I think. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, confess this whole situation to us and we'll drop this PCP case, which you have, you know, basically facing life over. And whatever you say, if it, you know, if it matches up to everything that we check, none of this could be used to implicate you in the actual crime. Well, the guy actually confessed to his nephew killing the man. Yeah. Now, from what I know, if I'm with you and I commit a crime, a murder, at least, I got that same case. Correct. But 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 what I'm saying is the way that the way they structured that. Yeah, that's he, he was not he was not charged with that murder. Now, if other evidence comes out later on and, and pins him to the murder, then that's a whole different situation. But. His actual confession could not be used to, to, to okay, actually. Okay, don't you think he pinned himself and, and all the other people saying that they saw him and, they, and, and he did and that? And not only that, he said he did it, he puts himself there. So if I say I saw him, I can't be lying because he put himself there. It's, 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 it's a tricky situation. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so if he win, oh well. well. I mean, he's still out right now. Do your thing. Yeah. Do your thing. Do you consider that snitching? Well, his nephew was gone. Yeah, I, th I, I think I don't think he should have said anything. He should have took that to his grave. I mean, my nephew did that. I mean, that's like me putting my brother out there because I know he's gone and he can't be convicted of nothing. I can sit and say what Buntry did on death row. No, I can't say what Buntry did on death row. Everybody know. Everybody on death row was assholes. That's all they need to know. Yeah. Well, after this happened. Suge was, I guess, violated his probation because of the fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Reggie Wright actually said that... That was done between the attorneys. I was there. How it happened was uh, Edie Fall. You all you know Edie Fall from the one of the guys that represented uh, on the, the Rodney King, the, the, the war with the beat up Reginald Denny. He was pop popular attorney from that. Well, anyway, Edie Fall and David Kenner, well, they, we all met at the studio at, the, at, at Edie Fall's office. And um, they came up with a, where well, they were about to sue or they were in the process of suing Tupac. And they came up to agreement, well, hey, if you come and testify, because we're trying to save Shooks from going to jail to do that, you know, nine year mm -hmm. violation. And testify that she was trying to really help you. He was trying to get, get them off you. He wasn't one that assaulted you. He was really trying to stop everybody from assaulting you. If you'll come and testify to that, we'll give you a, you know, we'll settle this case with you for, I think it was $60,000. Uh, I wouldn't put that past him. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, Reggie, Reggie said it on camp. But if he did, I mean, I wouldn't put it past him. Yeah. You know, it was a lot of things that, you know, when me and Shook started out, it was me and Suge and a couple of little homies. You know, I even told little Reggie, you know, I love you to death, but Suge shouldn't have never brought you to death row. Reason why I'm saying that is because little, little Reggie had issues with some of the guys that was working for death row. So when you did that, what was the purpose of Suge doing that? Suge's purpose was to have Reggie there to keep us at a bay. Mm. Because oh, I see what it is. We on his neck. And oh, okay. So he had the Ma Piru dudes as muscle, but then he had Reggie and the police to kind of control that muscle in in a way. And exactly, it was a balancing act. So oh, okay, I never, that, thought of, I never thought of it that just way. Just picture all the big homies, all the homies, right? Because everyone in here, every gangster is ultimately scared of the police <laughs> to a certain degree. It was it wasn't that. Just say for instance. You got all these guys out of the penitentiary. These guys really don't know you from jack shit, but they telling you, man, what the fuck do this nigga think he's talking to? Suge couldn't talk to you like that. Suge didn't have the control. The only control Suge had was letting you see what how many numbers on that check. And, oh, that's cool. But, I mean, we had homies fighting each other, stabbing each other over a paycheck or what was going on because the Suge said, now here come Reggie Wright. When he brought Reggie and his security in, 
everybody got a wusa because Reggie is is moving with Shield like this right. now. And he's the police. Yeah. So I ain't finna send myself back to prison. See, it was a lot of shady shit going on now. Now you got brothers, they finding the stashes in your car. Everybody that was getting mad at Shug, they find the stash in the car now, and he's doing five, six years in prison. He he had a way to get rid of the ones that he was really afraid of. I mean, after that whole situation happened, Shug ends up going to jail. And a lot of infighting starts to happen. Um, what was the situation that happened with your brother, Buntry? Infighting was before Shug went to jail. Um, a lot of people don't understand that that the more Buntry got closer to Suge, the less money that they were getting because Suge was doing a lot for Buntry. So he was um, paying Buntry well. Yeah, Alton was Buntry was getting more money than everybody. Some of the guys that was there were like straight cutthroat, like the one that killed Buntry, George. Was was so like. How the fuck this dude is getting this, and I'm getting this. You giving me peanuts, and he getting this. So it was a lot of everybody fighting each other. And it all depends on if Suge telling, man, he told me he going to do woo woo because you getting this. What the fuck you telling him that for? Now, you know he going to go back to him and say, motherfucker, you told Suge woo woo. And now, there's, now they stabbing each other, now the homies, and I'm telling them. I'm telling all of them. I told my family before Bunchy was killed that got to watch out, bag up. This shit is this. And it was always mom James, you drinking, you drunk, you tripping, and, and shit like this. Well, I mean, Buntry's making, I guess, real money for the first time. I mean, legal money, I guess. The, for first, the first time, time ever in his life. First time ever, yeah. Yeah. So, so he's not going to just leave that situation. Well, that's why none of them, nobody yeah. wanted to leave that situation. I mean, everybody that was on death row, this was pretty much a first paper check. This is, I don't have to rob a Mexican. I don't have to right. do this and that for it. Along with the fame of being in the spotlight. And then and along with that, and then the, the liquor, the women, the, I mean, everything, everything came with that. You know what I'm saying? You go to a concert. If you don't get none, then you you got a problem. That's on you. Uh, if you don't come, <laughs> if you don't, <laughs> your wife looking at you. Look I crazy, mean, right? drinking and I mean, just the whole line. It's a it's a total different atmosphere than being on the block selling cocaine. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then going places you've never been outside of Compton. So the situation with Buncher, you said that George killed him. Yeah. And George was a, a pyro also? Yeah. Okay. He got stabbed? Who? Uh, your brother. No, he was shot nine times. He was shot nine times. Bunch, Alton wasn't the first that was killed under Suge Night Watch. And this is where everybody is, oh, Buntry, it's just Buntry dead. You got Vincent. You got... Heron, you got um, Hen Dog, you got Chin. You, I mean, I can just name them. This was ten or eleven people. Yeah, you got all of these guys up under the ten or eleven Pyrus. Pyrus were killed, under associ death row associating watch. with death row. Yeah, by other members. By the same members that's in death row. Wow. Death row was fighting. The homies is clashing at each other like this now, because because they were fighting over money. Over the shit that Suge was saying and doing. Yeah. Over, over, yeah, they say the, not just the money now. It's okay, you fucking with my homie. This is my dog. And now everybody is fighting each other. You know what I'm saying? And when, when I tried to tell them that this, this shit is coming, nobody wanted to listen to me. You know what I'm saying? Your brother gets shot nine times yeah. uh, by George, another, another Pyro member. D does he get convicted? No. Um, at that time, before Alton was shot, Davey, little Dave, little Dave, Brim Dave was killed in front of our house. Um, he and Buntry walked outside. He walked to the car with his girlfriend. 
they shot him 16 times, and the girl was shot, I think, four or five. I think she lost her arm, he lost his life. Then Buntry was shot. And when Buntry was shot, somebody that was with Buntry had called and told them where Buntry was at. Now there's an armed fledged war between each other in death row. Uh, it ain't no going back. Um, you had Haron at the time hiding in bushes trying to catch a cat that was saying the same man George said he he going to kill him. So it was just it was just one after the other. Yep. And when Buntry got killed it was it was uh it was crazy because he was riding around taking care of his business, doing his thing. And these guys that came to the house once before but Buntry, what's happening? What are we doing? And he, I ain't worried about that. And um, it's, it's like he wasn't tripping. But my sister the other day showed me some of this 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 uh, piece out the Bible that he had the same day, the day before he died, he had it on his nightstand. And I don't, I think Buntry knew something. He had to know because. It was it was all it was all over the place, and it wasn't no more place of business for Death Row. You couldn't go up there and hang together and kick it like it was from the beginning. Everybody had their guns. You got to have your gun on you, uh, like Haron. Haron never got caught slipping without his gun. Here he is, going up Rosecrans, stop at the light, and this guy. I hop out, him and a couple of buddies, and they shoot him like 30, 40 something times. Just just shot his shit up. So, so what happened to George then? George wound up going to to the feds for water, some PCP and some guns, and wind up getting life behind that, him and Lil Rod. Um, which a lot of those guys in the neighborhood was scared of George because they was doing what they was doing and how they was getting down, recruiting other bloods from different places and all of that. But So George was never charged with that murder? Uh, I don't think they even bothered with it after he got sentenced to life in the feds. What's the difference? What's the difference? Every February 5th, that's his birthday. Yeah. You go through it all over again. I, I could say this a hundred times. If I wouldn't uh, if I wouldn't have brought my brother to death row, I wouldn't have put him in this situation. I think about I should have I should have did something to Shug. I should have. I try to figure out what what I could have did. And, and and he'd still be alive. I say it's my fault because I seen it coming. No matter what I said to to Buncher, he didn't listen to me. Um, no matter what I said to Suge, it might have scared him at that time, but turned his head and went the other way. And I should have felt like he should have been more afraid of me than any one of them other guys. But it didn't happen that way. Right. So, Because you had already distanced yourself from, from being yeah. by that. Yeah. I'm sorry for your loss, man. But Bunchy was your older brother? My younger brother. Younger brother. Oh, so yeah. that was your little... That's my little that's brother. That's your little man. Yeah. Well, I got another one... Uh, Timmy, 
and then Ouch and me. But yeah, that was my brother. Um, we fought, we argued. You know, I argued with him about a lot of shit that was going on with Death Row, and and he didn't want to listen to me. Um, grown man, out of your business. Uh, we stopped talking for a minute. You know, my whole thing was Bunchy. Why you keep calling my mama and telling my mama what I'm doing, and you on some bullshit? Yeah. Why you letting her talk to Suge, and getting her out the bed, coming to the to the shop and telling me come on or coming to you know just I mean they 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 couldn't control me they had to call my mama so my mama get on the phone and and uh talk a little sense to me and I I I leave and leave them alone as much as much pain as you went through losing losing your brother I'm just going to guess that it's it's a fraction of what your mother went through yeah yeah, and just to see her every day, from the from when we first found out, and when we got there, and to see her whole facial, her expression change, her body just like ready to fold. There was nothing nobody can do, and I I see it every day. Every time I think about it, I see it every day. And it was killing me. So I knew she was going through it way worse. Um, me and her had our differences. I mean, she just dealt with it in every night. Or nights you come in and you hear her crying. Um, I wouldn't wish it on nobody, but then you look, you you look at it as this is the shit that I was doing every day to people, gang bang. Yeah. All the guys that died in death row got a mama, got a brother, got a sister, got got family, and all these people was crying. But here you got a Suge Knight sitting here bitching and crying about going to prison. And people is, is, is like on Suge Knight's side, <clears throat> oh, Mob James is saying this. I'm like this. I lost more than a paycheck. Fuck that check. I lost my brother doing this. Sure can't bring him back. Sure can't pay for him. And then after the shit that he did after Buntry passed, can't nobody tell me nothing about Suge Knight. Nobody. I was just on bomb on Reggie's new thing, saying, I'm going to take my foot off this man's neck because he's going through 28 years. It ain't even worth talking about Suge Knight no more. It's, it's with, with all the work... That that all the the pyrus put in for death row, all the blood that was shed, all the you know all the violence that happened, all the people that you guys protected, and everything else like that. At the end of the day, you said that everyone is still in the hood. No one has any money. No one even has a nice car. We ain't got one millionaire. We ain't got one. Thousand dollars. We ain't got not one, not one man prospered from that. Not one. Everybody is back where they at. And and when I say that, a lot of people give me twisted and saying that I'm bitching about what we got paid or where, where we at. Take your licks. I take my licks. I'm the first one to admit that if 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 I can do this again, I I would I get paid. And everybody else would be getting paid. But everybody knew what the outcome of this was going to be pretty much because when Suge went to jail, Suge took back everything. He didn't want nobody to drive. He didn't want nobody to live. Oh, so, so all the cars were basically leased under death row? Yeah. And then when he went to jail, he took everyone's cars park back. Em. Park it. Park it. If I ain't driving and out there hanging out, enjoying the bitches and this and that, give up the car. Mm. 
and they was and, and these is killers, and they was putting parking the cars, and the only reason why they was parking the cars because when she would come home, they want to be in good grace. Mm. Come on, man. You are back to doing what you was doing before you even met him. Now everybody is back on the same page. So death row for everybody was a waste of life, period. At one point, Suge was essentially looked at as untouchable. Nobody got close to Suge. Nobody uh, dared, dared to even badmouth him. Publicly. Oh, no. Wouldn't dare. But at one point, all the Pyrus essentially, you know, all the OG Pyrus kind of separated from him. And then I think you said that's when he started getting knocked out and, and everything else like that. Well, when everybody started going, well, after, after Bunchy was killed, and then Haron, I mean, uh, Hen Dog was killed, pretty much everybody started leaving him alone uh, or going back to prison. Then he didn't have no choice but to recruit what I called the little homies. So the little homies was hanging, but they didn't have that oomph mentality. So you take this this big ass wall that you got behind you, when people look at you, they see these motherfuckers ready to eat. Cause motherfuckers was getting paid more. If I if you knock if I knock a motherfucker out, they was getting paid more. They was getting a bonus or something. Mm -hmm. So they don't see that no more. So without that, let me get at this cat. Motherfuckers was pouring drinks on him, slapping him. Uh, the knockout, I think, was was lucky. But well, there was a couple of knockouts. There, yeah, were, there was no, the barber guy, then I'm there was also Akon's guy. Yeah, my boy, he from the second to none. The one that drove the tow truck is the one I'm talking about. Oh, okay. No, but there was also the Akon situation. Well, because what I, what I want to say is, at one point, Suge loses death row completely. Yeah. You know, and, and Reggie explained how essentially he didn't show up to court. A default judgment is what caused them to have to file bankruptcy. Not that Harry O was correct or the judge, they went through a trial or anything like that. He, it, didn't, he didn't show up to trial. He just didn't show up. Some people would, would say, okay, well now... I don't have all this money. Let me change the way I operate. Let me not push the issue with people. Let me be that likable guy. Because everyone wanted to fuck with Suge. You know, Suge could have gotten into other situations, but Suge continued to push the line with people. He, people you know, wanted... like the Akon situation when yeah. he got knocked out by Ja was him trying to collect royalties off of from a producer. The same thing that happened same with shit. Chocolate. People wanted to hang with Suge because... A lot of people were scared of people in the industry itself. And to fuck with Suge is, is, ain't nobody gonna fuck with you because they know you fuck with Suge. We brung a lot to Suge that, that a lot of people don't know. We gave Suge what he is. And, and with that, a lot of people in the industry was so afraid of Suge or thinking these game bankers is gonna come blow my house up or they finna this and, and I can't be seen on the, the music scene no more. I can't be caught at the studio. People paid Suge to be around Suge. Right. I mean, because I can tell you from, from personal experience, I, I was, you know, Vlad TV was in Universal Records at one point in New York. Mm -hmm. And in the security office, there was a picture of Suge on the wall and it says, do not allow in the building because... Suge had threatened the president of Universal at the time over some royalties or whatever. Mm -hmm. There was an armed security guy in front of the building. Whenever the president was there, they would escort him to his car yeah. and back. Yeah, and this was this was after death row was gone and everything else like that. This is still happening. But his shenanigans were still going on. That's what I'm saying. You know, Suge was still going out of town. He was still going to New York. He was still going to places. And his tactics wouldn't work no more because he didn't have the same people. Yeah. So without yeah, those he, he people, he got shot in Miami. Yeah. And so got without shot the Chris Brown, thing without that, and, yeah. Now everybody is testing you. Now you got to really show who you are, and look what happened every time he got tested. Every time he got tested, we had a fight with. I'm just gonna tell you this story with the Rams, his team, which when they cut him, they was talking shit. Uh, we seen them at the. Uh, Roxy, and uh, 
they stretched his car. Instead of him doing what he had to do, he ran into the club and got us. It's like nine of them, 11 of us, but these are some big motherfuckers. And I'm looking at Shook like, you really want to fight these motherfuckers? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, they move. He said, well, why are you going there and get them when I stressed your shit, bitch? Shook should have took off and handled his business right then and there. Now, if you 240 pounds lighter than him, yeah, he going to slap the shit out of you. But if we the same, equal the same weight, he going to think about it. He going to think about it. And Buntry and all of them seen that. And the other people seen it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, who is you to grab a woman that's weighed 120 and you damn near 400 pounds? Talking about the, the Cat Williams yeah. situation. So, right. I mean, he just he was just so full of shit. Right. But it ain't there no more. Yeah, and he also uh, he also slapped up the dude at the weed shop. When you saw that uh, the, the Showtime documentary, uh, America's Nightmare, and you see Suge at the end crying, you know, behind his sunglasses. Uh, uh, how did that make you feel? I I felt kind of uh, sorry for Suge. It, it was it was kind of sad because I'm I'm watching him and I'm looking at him and this ain't Suge Knight, you know. The Shook Knight I knew didn't didn't do drugs, was no alcoholic. This cat right here look like an alcoholic. This cat is talking, but you don't understand shit he's talking about. This ain't Shook Knight. And Shook Knight pretty much did like Scarface. At the end of the day, you're going to wreck yourself. With, with all the guys that are dead, and everybody is gone, and, and where Death Row is at now, he's pretty much right there too. So I can say he's where he belonged. And he dug that ditch for himself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I feel sorry for him, but then I don't feel sorry for him because on the other hand, I think 28 years, that's three years maybe for each Guy that lost their life. She'll, she'll gets locked up for the Terry Carter, you know, death. And I, I did a lot of interviews around, you know, while he was locked up. And I said, you know, I think he has a chance of getting off. I think this might be self-defense. You know, I had Big U on here and he said, oh, yeah, no, Shug, Shug will do a year or two. I think he got about, he was probably going to do about three more calendars, three, four more calendars at the most. Three more years? At the most. And then get out? Yeah, he'd be he'd be home. He'd definitely be home. And then lo and behold, Suge accepts a twenty eight year plea deal. Suge didn't want to. He didn't want to take life. Yeah, he didn't want the life. One thing people don't understand: Suge got so many, had so many cases in his office. Right. He had boxes of files with cases that he was fighting. Um, but he was assaults. Yeah, he had three felonies that he was fighting, and he would have to beat. Yeah, Reggie explained it. He would have to beat all three in court, and then beat another three potential appeals. Yeah. And he just felt that he would not be able to win six trials in a row. I spoke to him once after the plea, and what he pretty much explained or said was he would have had to win six times to not get life in jail. Win six times. Because there were six different charges? It was three different charges. But he would have had to beat those twice because they would have kept retrying him. He knew he wasn't. He knew yeah. he wasn't. So he, he, he did the right thing. He did the right thing. But uh, 28 years, I mean, he in there now. So my whole thing is let him do his time. And, and I'm just whatever with the dude, whatever with the dude. I ain't got my brother, you know what I'm saying? So don't bitch over the 28, you know what I'm saying? Which I hear he's doing his thing. So I'm not, man, I'm like pretty much fed up with shit. When you found out about the 28 years, did it bring any sort of closure with your brother? No, not really. Um, I was like, 28 years, damn, he's the same age as me, 53, 81 years old. He'll be done. He won't be fucking. He can't make kids. 
Okay. I, I mean, I thought all kind of shit. But, I mean, it pretty much stripped him. It stops the 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 fuckery. Um, he don't have the little homies or nobody that he can use or pay to do his dumb shit. Everything now he got to do it on his own because he got to do that time. Can't nobody else do it for him. So the Suge Knight is 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 washed away. You know, the only time I really truly felt sorry for Suge is when Maxine passed and they wouldn't let him go see her. That's his mother? Yeah. Um, my mother just passed. Well, my little brother sense. was in jail and she didn't want my brother to die while she was in there. She said, I, I, I don't want him in there if something happened to me. So I know what he would have went through. So I know what she was going through. Yeah. Um, since my mother passing, it's, it's hard for me, but I can't do nothing but move on. And my hatred for for Suge and anybody else is I'm good. I, I can't move on if I'm still feeling the way I feel about those cats. The ones that got something bad to say or, or whatever the case might be. If you ain't saying it to me, I'm good with you. And that's how I feel. Um, my brother Buntry, Last year, I did not uh, get pissy drunk and and wanted to hoorah, hoorah. Um, I, I'm getting older. I have to accept it. I have a grandson, grandkids, and my focus is on that now. Yeah. I don't too old for the shit that I used to do, so... I ain't tripping. If Suge walked in the room right now and sat on this couch, what would you tell him? What would I tell him? Yeah, or what would you do? I would just tell him, fuck you. If, if, if me and Suge can have a conversation, if I can get on the phone and talk to Suge right now today, I'd tell Suge, you should have listened to me. When we first started, you should have listened to me. You shouldn't have put on that motherfucking devil suit, the red suit. You shouldn't have done none of that shit. You shouldn't have been in the pictures and all that other shit. You should have listened to me. But you didn't. You turned everybody against me just to suit yourself. And then look where they at and look where you at. I got a lot to say to him. A lot to say to well, him. I mean, he's got the time to talk these days. No, I don't I'm not I'm not finna reach out to Shield. Yeah. No, that's that's over and done. Yeah. We 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 we've been there and and he chose to get on. Which okay, cool. But I, 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 I'm gonna let it go. I gotta let it go. You know, I don't care what Trayvon and none of those guys say about Tupac. Uh, Y'all want Tupac to be from the hood? Think one thing. It makes you guys look bad because he was killed on your watch. Um, Y'all allowed this man to do shit that that he shouldn't have did and had no business doing. You know what I'm saying? And then at the end of the day, y'all glorified by, oh, that's the homie. That don't mean shit. We got a lot of dead homies. But y'all killed your money. You know what I'm saying? And they don't see the they don't see the the, the, the difference. It's it's Ain't nobody smart in this this at all. So then you fast forward a couple years and they're filming straight out of Compton. Sugar's friends with Terry Carter. Was Terry around during the whole? Well, Terry always been around. Well, he's he's one of the founder of the Bluffs. Yeah, he's he's always been around. He ain't. I mean, that was one of the coolest cats that you can ever deal with. You know, a lot of motherfuckers say my brother Buncher was a cool motherfucker and took care of cats while they was in prison. Terry Carter is one. And and Suge knew he was a cool motherfucker. He ain't finna do nothing to Suge. Um, Bones, I don't think Bones gonna do nothing to Suge. But this is your problem. You coming up there looking for Dre, talking about he owe you some money. Dre left death row with zero money, dollars. He walked away, I don't want nothing, just let me go. So here Suge is, now Dre worth a lot of money. He think 
Dre know what's going on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get two hundred fifty thousand, maybe a million out this motherfucker, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So them talking to Sugar, then the situation escalated. Escalated. Now Sugar is scared. Well, after after Bone ended up beating yeah. him up in the car. Yeah. Now he's scared. Now he he just went to take off. He just went to take the fuck off because he he's scared now, and that's how that happened. Right. And if he had just taken off and dri driven off, nothing would have happened. Even even if he'd have got out the car and, and went and hollered at Bones or talked to you know what I'm saying, talk to the situation now, he'd have been cool. But no, Suge was scared, and and he panicked. Right, and then he backed up, and then ran over Bones, <sighs> and then killed. On accident, ended up killing Terry Carter. Terry Carter was trying to pretty much tell him, hold up, hold up. And Suge went blind at that time. I think the cataract hit the left eye, and he couldn't see no more. Well, that's what he said in court. He said, yeah. Blind. Uh, he had so many motherfucking health issues after that shit. It's pathetic. Yeah. And, and I remember I interviewed uh, Trey D, who was being managed. Well, he was managed by Terry Carter at one point. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very close to Terry. Mm -hmm. And he said that his, his problem with that whole situation was... You know, when he walked in and turned himself in and the cameras was out there and... You know, he just put the cigar out and put it in the tree and said, yeah, you know, I'll be back to get this in the morning, you know, and just, you know, walked in like like it wasn't nothing. I didn't see no remorse or no, you know, confusion or, you know, uh, he wasn't, he didn't even seem to be unsettled. And then when I heard what had happened in the interim of, that going on and him bagging up and running over Terry and everything, you know, he he just, you know, went allegedly, you know, went freshened up, you know what I'm saying? He knew what was coming, you know, parlayed with his little piece or whatever and, um, you know, hey man, let me go get this out the way. Like, like it was, it was nothing. And, it, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sit here and pretend that, you know, I'm just so broke up about it that, you know what I'm saying, it, it just disturbs me to that degree, but it's like I would want to know, like, damn, man, how could you knock your boy off like that and then it not even show on you? You can't have remorse if you never, if you, you didn't live this. You ain't yeah. live like this. We lose a homie, we at the funeral, we crying, we going through it because we done lost the homie. Suge haven't lived that life. He ain't lived like that. So our lives wasn't worth shit. You know, really didn't mean shit to him. That's why he continued to do what he did. We done lost all these homies on death row, man. We need a memorial or something. We need to do yeah. something. Half of them he didn't even want to help bury or didn't. I, I interviewed a DOC who was, mm -hmm. you know, basically was the one that brought Suge around into the into what eventually became Death Row. Yeah. And the way he explained it to me was that... Suge was a big kid. He's a deviant. You know what I mean? Like, he used to tell stories about pissing on football players' legs in the shower and thought that was just the funniest shit in the world. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Suge was baiting him in. Uh, I liked it him, too, until he did what he did. But DLC. And I don't care who knows. I don't like him either. Uh, he was a fucking weenie for sure. And he uh, was a yes man and sure fucked him at the end of the day. And and now he see, and now he regret fucking with Suge. But yeah, Suge went up in him dry, dry as fuck. Uh, what does that mean? Fucked him with no grease. Oh, okay, got it. But I mean, he did him like pretty much everybody that 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 had his back, and and you know, DOC was there for him. And then at the end of the day, he threw me away. Like, fuck that, his throat is fucked up. He ain't no good. And this how he telling us, fuck DOC. So I think we had the Soul Trains Award 
and DOC jumped in the limo and took off with all of us. This limo full of pyros. And uh, he took off with us, hitting street corners, hitting alleys, and I'm talking about shaking us up. So we pulled back in front of the the uh, the Soul Trains Awards, and and he gets out laughing, but he's drunk. Mm, yeah. So the homeboy Rock wanted to shoot him. No, don't shoot him. Hold up, I got him. Man, you just know what you did. And he was hey, 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 hey. so I sucked him in his mouth. And he on the ground, slid him on the car. And a female ran and said, oh, oh, he hit DOC, he hit DOC. She'll come over there, hey, hey, who hit him? Nigga, I hit him. I'm lucky I hit him because he was going to get shot. So him too, with his shenanigans, he was full of shit. And he set himself up on the Suge Knight propaganda. And and he thought he was gonna come out on the other end, but he came out on the same end we did, straight out the asshole. And and he where he at because of that. You you have kids. How many how many children three. do you have? I got three. And how many grandkids? Three. Three. Did your kids uh, bang at all? No. 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 And your grandkids are still small. Oh wait a minute. Let me let me let me clarify that. My two sons. College, everything. My daughter is is me and her mother. Yeah. My daughter is a little rougher than my sons <laughs> and is I, I'm trying my best with her. And I have her son right now. Um my grandson. And I'm helping her with my grandson. But she coming along. But she's she's my payback. Oh, That's so she's mind. actually somewhat involved in. She's a South Side. She's from South Side. Oh, she's from. Yeah. Your, your enemies yeah. side, essentially. Yeah, exactly. God, so God has an interesting way of <laughs> working things out. Her mama is from South Side, so. Right. So I'm going to stop moving so much for you. It's okay. But yeah, her mama is from South Side, so she went that way, but it's okay. I mean, the older she get, and I think the older we all get, we learn. And and I'm learning from a lot of my mistakes every year. Yeah. So she got a while to go, but she'll get there. You know, when you look at your kids and your grandkids, and it's like, look, I've been shot four times. I've done this much prison time. I lost my brother. I lost my close friends. I didn't make any money. I don't, I don't have a bag to show for it. You know, if they if they tell you, hey, Grandpa, I wanna, I wanna follow your footsteps. I wanna be an OG like you. What would you tell them? I would, and I tell them this, and my sister vouched for me. My nephews, they all claim the mob. The majority of them is my baby brothers, sons, mm -hmm. but my nephews, they all claim the mob. I hear stories about them saying. My oldest son say the mob when he drink, but he's just not a gangbanger. I tell him all the time, the homies killed your uncle. I feel stupid because I represented this shit and gave a lot to my neighborhood. A lot of penitentiary chances. I hurt a lot of people from my neighborhood. Now your uncle is dead by bloods, not no crips. That defeated the purpose, and that killed me in the inside. You don't want to be a gangbanger. You're not going to get paid for it. When you go to jail, you ain't going to get a check. Then I point out to them this. The first year after your uncle died, they forget about you. Mm. And I tell my kids, I tell my nephews, I tell all of them, you're not going to get paid doing this. You ain't getting nothing out of this but the penitentiary. Don't be like me and say, if I would have, should have, could have. Go to school and do what you got to do. Right. Don't you be like me, you're going to have a problem. And they don't listen. <laughs> so if they don't listen, now you got to, they grow up the way they want to grow up. Yeah. Um, I'm there for them. 
but I can't, I can't, I can't, yeah, I can't make them. Well, but your two sons went to college. Yes. Which is great. Yes, I, my oldest son is raising his daughter from day one. Uh, my youngest son is so smart. He went to Texas, the Longhorns. A and M. Yeah. Uh, he's a computer freak. He's 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 really he a geek. Nice. Uh, but my boys are good. Yeah. He don't have no kids. My youngest son don't have no kids. Twenty two, and. My oldest son, he has a daughter that he's been raising for 10 years on his own. Mm. Um, they're good. My daughter is <laughs> my, my, no, seriously. But I love it, though, because yeah. I love my daughter. Yeah. And and my kids is everything to me. So I, now I got to figure out now when I start, when the grandpa thing came, I got to change the game. I got to change up. I got to I got to be here for them. I got to know who was my grandpa. No, I I see that in my 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 nephew Lou Alton kids that have never seen their grandpa. Yeah. And I know if if Bunchy was here, that first granddaughter of his would have been on and cracking. He'd have been he'd have loved her. Yeah. But she never know her grandpa. So I'm soaking all this. I got to be there for my kids and my grandkids. And the whole year and a half left of my mother's life, I'm there at the house with her. And I, what, seven, eight months, I got my grandson. So it's me, my mom's, and my grandson. And, man, he's the joy of my life because this dude is two years old and he do everything. He does everything. He's so smart, but he bad. <laughs> and they say terrible too. That ain't terrible too. He's doing stuff that you wouldn't think nobody gonna do. But Death Row taught me a lot. Made me understand a lot. Uh, friendship and loyalty. A lot of the homies you think had loyalty, but they didn't possess it at all from the beginning. And my mother used to tell me, your friends ain't who you think they are. You'll see. Your family is your friends. When Buntry passed, I seen there was no loyalty in my hood. I couldn't, I, there's no way in the world I could stay here. You know, I could be a part of this. These niggas don't have loyalty. Uh, all these guys, I went out of my way. I don't smoke weed, never did. But I would get my check from sure, come to the hood, buy liquor, buy weed, and put it out there. And everybody, as long as I'm, I'm feeling good while I'm drinking, everybody else is going to feel that way. If you got shot, I'm gone. I'm out there. Loyalty. A lot of, I had to join the motorcycle club to, to see what that meant. And I have some good friends in the motorcycle club. If I call, they coming. These these dudes in the hood is, you know, the game banking thing is, the loyalty, nigga, your blood. You don't say this, you don't do this. Where's my loyalty? You cats. Don't care. Y'all don't talk about Buntry. Y'all ain't on no Buntry. Y'all ain't on no hand dog. Y'all got pictures of Tupac on your body. Let's do roll call. What about Top Dog and all the other homies that is dead? Big Frank, Showboat, all, all these cats. They worried about Tupac. Okay. No longer than two years, maybe three years, Tupac in your life. Now he's gone. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. Excuse me. Loyalty is out the window these days. And, you know, you, these older cats is not teaching these younger cats, you know, what loyalty means, uh, what friendship means. 
uh, you got a lot of things like money comes into play, and and I, I kill you for some money, or I'll turn my back on you for this and that, for some pussy or whatever. It's it's just I'm I'm saying it all wrong, and and I got it right here how what what I'm saying that it really touch you, but I'm just it's just so fucked up right now. I mean, when you look at the 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 rules and the structure and the principles that you were raised in, you're not supposed to snitch. You're supposed to, you know, something happens to one of your one of your homies. You're supposed to put in work. You do all these things, and then on the once you do them, oftentimes, where's the win? You know what I mean, like. You, you don't snitch, you know, you're involved in a crime, you don't snitch, you do these years in prison, you come out, what's waiting for you? Usually nothing. nothing. You know, you, like, for example, like, you know, I, I interviewed uh, Freeway Ricky, mm -hmm. you know, as well as uh, Lil D. I don't know if he was the crack king yeah. of, of, of yeah. Oakland. They both told me they got locked up with millions, you know, they had millions of dollars when they got locked up and got yeah. their 30 whatever year, you know, lifetime sentences. They put money and property in their families and friends' names. And every single time when they got out, there was nothing there for them. And when you get all that time, you have to trust somebody. You got to let people owe money. You got to let people have their, your, your properties and their names. And majority of the guys that you have a conversation with that did a bunch of those years, throughout those years, family and friends, they're going to spend that money, man. Because they feel like you don't need it, though. Like they, In their mind, they say, all you need is some money to go to the commissary and get on the phone. Absolutely. Same thing with you? Same thing. Same Identical thing. stories. Identical. Yeah. So all these people that are getting locked up who think that their, their the relatives media, and their homies are going to hold on to that half a million in cash and that it, property and those cars and when you, you know come what? out. And when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're doing it, you're thinking like, you're going to accumulate this stuff, and when you come home, you will have that. Yeah, but when you came out, you had nothing. Nothing. All these rules that you are supposed to follow, and you're supposed to be a, a, real, a real street dude, a real, a real Piru, do you feel that a lot of it was a lie? I, I knew, I believed in what I was. I believed in the game banging thing, period. Uh, that was my life. At one time, in my younger days, I disrespected my mama for my neighborhood. Mm. Uh, she couldn't tell me that these weren't my friends. She couldn't tell me that one of these cats that's sitting at this table right here is going to be the one to kill you. She couldn't tell me that back then. If she told me, it happened. It happened. So the homies, the hood, or none of that can't tell me shit because they ain't looking out for Lil Alton. They ain't looking out for his son, Ascari. They ain't looking out, they didn't look out for my moms. You know, Suge didn't do that. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, didn't, I didn't get a check when Bunchy was killed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I never got a check, but now I'm a, nobody I ever hurt. You know what I'm saying? This is what we was doing. And, 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 and for this to be my life, and then at the end of the day, my friends killed my brother, man, that killed me. So there's no way in the world I can, I can be a part of this and, and, and still feel good about it. Yeah. And that's why I don't understand why my nephews and my other brother still want to be a part of this. Yeah. Ain't, ain't that much street out here. Right. And this is why in the beginning of the interview when I said you're a mob pyro, you said used to be. Yeah. So you, you yeah. don't claim it anymore. No, I don't. Man, you better sock me upside my head if I ever say <laughs> that again in my life. Um, no, I don't. I, uh, I think I was let down. The, I mean, the hood let me down. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think a lot of things supposed to have been different when he passed, different when Haron passed, different when Hendog passed, different when Chen passed, Vincent. Uh, uh, every every man that was was killed in here, 
You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of shit should have been different. And I think if if we represent this and this is what we is, at some point we all got to come together like Godfathers and put a stop to it. Ain't nobody saying none of that. Everybody pointing the finger over here, over there. And 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 this man is still doing his thing. So all these guys from the different hoods in Compton that that these brothers that lost their lives, ain't none of the homies stepping up and say, I hear what you're saying, Mob James. You know what I'm saying? So I don't have to speak. So you're pretty much telling me, fuck me anyway. But I say to you, fuck you. You feel me? And and it's 18 years, 16 years, 17 years since my brother's death. I don't... Honestly, I don't give a fuck. Just leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. Yeah. And that's where it's at. Well, I mean, I, I could tell you, you know, we, you know, we have a pretty big audience. A lot of people watch our interviews, young and old. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that I can guarantee you that someone's going to watch this, you know, who's thinking about gangbanging, who, you know, looks up to Lil Wayne, you know, throwing red rags, and Chris Brown, and... All the various other rappers who who glorify the gang banging thing, and they're gonna see this story and say, maybe not, maybe maybe I should reconsider. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, I, I I know so, because because I, I I get the DMs and I get the messages and I get people that say, hey, you know, th this interview changed my life, and you know, thank you, thank you for showing the other side of it because we don't try to glorify this. Yeah. You know, we 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 try to to show what really happens on the back end and it's never almost never a good ending well i'm i i got it uh i'm doing a book right now and i think my book is gonna truly explain to everybody what death row was and i mean we can all paint up paint a picture of death row we all demons we all demons we all fucked up and and you know when people see the interviews and they they comments one thing they say, I never blame myself. I'm I'm putting myself first because I fucked up and didn't do what I had to do with Suge. I should have had Suge in order and kept it in order. When Buncher came and everybody else got there and we'd have fixed that and cleaned that shit up at the beginning instead of letting it ride the way it did. And by not doing that, Sure was allowed to use us with his money. Uh, and we was easily influenced because a lot of us didn't have money like that and couldn't make money that way. Um, one thing about Suge is Suge couldn't tell me as a man, I need you to go and do whoop. Fuck you, you do it. We ain't getting down like that. You do it. Hmm. Now, if you do it, I come with you. <laughs> but if he ain't going to do it, why the fuck would I do it? Yeah. So me and Suge had that understanding. So Suge, no, he couldn't use me like that. So if you can't use me like that, now you're talking to all my friends, my homies. Yeah. And that's why I was speaking of loyalty. The loyalty should have lied with me. I broke bread with every last one of you cats on this, on this thing here, we done been in cars and trenches together. Every last one of you cats. Here come a cat that y'all never dealt with or, or known. And, and you say, fuck me for it. So the loyalty was shot as soon as they seen that paper. Yeah. It was over with. Yeah. And, and I should have left sooner, but I still wanted the paper. And I let Suge get away with a lot of shit that was going on because Suge said, I got something for you, come to the office. And I, it was okay. Yeah. Go up there, get a check, and then the situation is gone already. No, you should have just addressed the situation in front of the homies, and then everybody can see you for what you is, running your fucking mouth, and that was, let's, let's handle it. Didn't happen. Well, Mob James, uh... I think it's a very powerful story uh, that you told. And, you know, although you did have a lot of losses, yeah, here you are alive 
right now. You have children who are alive and healthy. You have grandchildren who are alive and healthy. You have a wife. You have siblings. Um, your father's still alive? No. No. Um, but you do have a lot of family. Yeah. You know, and friends and so forth. And that is something to be very thankful for. Yeah. Because you could have gone the route of a lot of your a lot of your homies. And um, you know, I think that what you've said is, is going to influence people in a positive direction. I hope so. And um, you know, I can't wait to, to read the book. Yeah, it, it comes. We 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 doing our thing and and it's it's coming. Uh I just my whole thing is that everybody understand, you know, a lot of people is making money off the Tupac thing. Tupac was killed by one man. This this guy and Tupac would still be alive if shit wouldn't happen. If mm -hmm. shit would have had more control. If I can't blame Reggie, but he should have had more than one man on that artist. This man is is a diamond. In a rough with 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 catch that's not worth five hundred bucks, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, should I say? Yeah, I mean, Tupac went down as what most people would say is the greatest rapper of all time, and in fact, you know, because of the revolutionary spirit and the content, you could go to any country in the world. You can go to Jamaica, you could go to South America, you go to Tupac. Europe, and there's murals because yeah. he was the face of the revolution. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, and he, we lost him from one man over a fight, over a, fight. A, over a, a fist fight, essentially. He hit a man that he had no business touching. It was not his fight. And all these guys be talking and saying that is this and that. Tupac should have been escorted out the door, into the car, and driving away when they was whooping his ass. Now, Orlando probably could have understood, would have accepted that ass whooping, because he know, I got some bona fide ass niggas whooping on my ass here. Right. I can catch him in Compton. No, Tupac take off him. This nigga ain't nothing but a rapper. This how he looking at him. He ain't looking at him like no, no gang banger. So I gotta get this fool. I go back home and they say, Tupac beat me up. I can't show my face in the hood no more. So he did what he had to do. It's tragic. Man, it's, it's tragic. tragic. It's tragic. Well, Mob James, uh, I appreciate you coming in and, and telling your story. Okay, right? okay. And, um, I know, need a cigarette. <laughs> my condolences to, to all your losses. And, yeah. You know, um, congratulations on, on your children and your grandchildren. Yeah, I love them to death. Yes, sir. Let me go. I got to go smoke a cigarette. <laughs>